Thank you, Niels, for the opportunity. Uh, I am uh, Nathan Wallach. I am a professor of digital arts at Stetson University, and I'm also co-director of the Young Sound Seekers Project, which I'll be talking about uh, a little bit as part of this uh, this presentation. Uh, my title today is Hur Hurricanes and Hydromoths, How Does a Low-Cost Recording Device Perform in Extreme Weather? Uh, this was originally, I was slated to give actually two little talks at the ASA conference, the Acoustical Society of America in, in 2023 in May. And I had to cancel uh, due to some personal things that uh, came up. So when uh, Niels approached me about this uh, online conference, I was uh, happy to get the opportunity to uh, take those and blend them together. So that's why you, you may have seen an earlier title. That was actually a title for the ASA conference uh, about Audio Moth Adventures. Uh, I decided to Focus in a little bit more about this uh, this two month deployment that we did uh, in Mosquito Lagoon at uh, in in Florida uh, that actually had some encounters with uh, Hurricane Ian about one year ago uh, this weekend. So um, on the screen right now is an image of a fishing dock uh, behind a location at Canaveral National Seashore known as Eldora. Uh, it's got a path about six feet wide uh, walking out a, a good. 10, 20 meters into the lagoon, uh, and then it expands into a, a larger uh, square platform that's about three times as wide uh, as the, the pathway leading out to it. Um, and on the, the dock, you've got uh, about five people, some of my students uh, and our co-director, Eve Pear, uh, who are looking out into the water. Uh, and uh, the sky is nice and blue with some nice uh, billowy clouds uh, above, uh, kind of painting the picture of where this location is uh, that we did these hydromoth deployments. So uh, my talk today is actually uh, gathered into four headings, uh, background, hydromoth, hurricane, uh, other results, and then I'll just wrap up with a little bit of summary. Uh, so I'll just uh, call attention to like when I move to the, each of those sections. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, some background information uh, about me and about Young Sound Seekers, just to give you some context to this uh, deployment that we did uh, here in Florida. So uh, my background, uh, I'm a sound artist. Uh, I'm not a bioacoustician by training. Uh, I've got my PhD in music technology and have a background uh doing stuff with audio signal processing, electronic music, that sort of stuff. But uh, about 10 years ago, field recording started featuring a lot more into my creative practice. Um, uh, so going out and recording uh, the sounds of nature, the sounds of, of habitats uh, in and around Florida and other locations. Um, I like to explore places where people go to get in touch with nature. So where uh, uh, things like public parks, things like nature reserves, uh, and in Florida, there's a, a rich diversity of habitats. So on the screen, I've got four images here uh, of the, the kind of uh, habitats that I, I get to record in here in Florida. So in the upper left corner, I've got some wetland environments. That's at Lake Woodruff uh, Natural, Wildlife Ref, uh, Natural Wildlife Refuge. In the lower left corner, I've got a, a beach uh, habitat uh, at, actually at Canaveral National Seashore. Uh, and you can see some plovers uh, there playing in the surf uh, that I was able, able to record uh, on that excursion. Um, I also have access to uh, springs, lakes, and lagoons, uh, like the picture that you see in the upper right corner uh, of me uh, recording uh, out on uh, docks near lagoons. And when I do that, I tend to record uh, stereo above the water as well as to put two hydrophones in the water and uh, use those those as a kind of a creative uh, material uh, for for pieces. Uh, and then we also have a lot of pine scrubs, uh, like the picture in the lower uh, right corner, uh, which are these kind of like not not as densely packed as you think of forests typically. So uh, pines that are kind of dis uh, have some distance between them, but then you've got a lot of low vegetation between them kind of covering the ground. So um, I got a hold of my first audio moth uh, in early 2020, uh, and I didn't have a, really a plan for what I was going to do with the audio moth recorder, but I knew that it was a platform that had some interesting capabilities, just this ability to program it and deploy it and capture sound. Uh, and then, of course, uh, COVID hit, and we had a shutdown here in Florida, and I immediately thought that this would be a good tool to... Um, do some uh, deployments during the shutdown to try to gain uh, some understanding of what's happening with the soundscape during the shutdown. Uh, initially in Florida, we were actually supposed to have a uh, complete stoppage of uh, boat traffic for recreational purposes. Uh, and then they kind of backtracked that and said, well, as long as everybody is in the same household, it was okay to be out boating. 
Uh, but I, I, I quickly took my audio moth recorders and ran out to a, a, a property that uh, my uh, university owns uh, on a lake called Lake Beresford um, and deployed in a little patch of woods. Uh, so the picture on the left is uh, a, a hydromoth recorder, or excuse me, audio moth recorder uh, strapped to a tree in a tiny Ziploc bag uh, recording in kind of a little patch of forest uh, uh, near the lake. And then I also uh, stapled one underneath a dock um, under uh, that was uh, on the on the lake. Uh, uh, you can see a picture in the upper right corner, uh, and the lower right corner is just a picture of me uh, setting it up with my laptop, uh, setting the configuration, picking uh, the the kind of uh, sampling protocol that I was going to use. And in that first deployment, uh, I decided to sh to focus on uh, dawn, noon, dusk, and midnight, and try to capture some sense of the soundscape. And it yielded some interesting results. Things like uh, frogs cor chorusing, things like uh, some of the just a, a, a sense of the different bird traffic that we had um, um, there on Lake Bearsford. Uh, but it quickly uh, led me to realize that this is going to produce a lot of data. Uh, and that was where I kind of leaned on some of my programming chops uh, and to uh, build some scripts that would take all of these audio recordings and quickly churn out uh, spectrograms for each one of them. Uh, and organize them into a table that can be displayed uh, in an HTML uh, web browser. Uh, and so these scripts are actually available on uh, GitHub. If you search for audio moth scripts and, and my name, they should pop up uh, no problem. Uh, and it's through these scripts and sharing them online that I actually got connected to some bioacousticians and got to know some other people that are using audio moth for interesting things uh, and started to get some ideas about other things that the audio moth could be, uh, could be used for. Um, in addition to uh, playing around with the audio moth, I uh, am uh, started in 2020 directing a group called Young Sound Seekers. Uh, it's actually a partnership between Stetson University and Atlantic Center for the Arts here in Florida. Uh, and we uh, lead a group of 13 to 25 year old uh, blind and partially sighted students uh, and, and design um, uh, excursions for them to the parks uh, and with the idea of overcoming barriers to access in the parks, getting this underserved population into the parks. Uh, we're fortunate enough to be supported by the National Park Service uh, directly through their uh, Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division, uh, who give us uh, both logistical support and also financial support uh, to for this programming. Uh, which has uh, been an interesting creative platform uh, for me to uh, to implement some of, and share some of my love of sound in natural environments uh, with a new group of of uh, students. Uh, so I've got on the uh, oh, sorry my previous screen I have a picture uh, just kind of a group picture from a summer camp we did um, and I'm all the way on the right uh, all the way on the left is uh, my co-director Eve Pear. Uh, from Atlantic Center for the Arts, and you can see many of the kids and as well as some of the chaperones uh, intermingled in this group picture that we did. Um, oh. uh, next up, I've got a slide with just an overview of the kind of excursions that we do. Um, so just a panel of four pictures. In the upper uh, left corner, you've got uh, a Walker working with my colleague, Dr. Charpentier, who's a, a professor of biology, uh, and she was talking about fiddler crabs, and we designed this little experiment, uh, seeing if they would react to uh, tones of different pitches. Uh, in the lower left corner, you've got uh, Haley and Serenity uh, actually listening to some hydrophones uh, as a boat passes on the St. John's River. Uh, in the upper right corner, uh, we had a, we had a cool trip to uh, Fort Matanzas here in Florida, which is a kind of uh, an old uh, Spanish fort from the 15th century, um, and got to explore it and do some field recording there, trying to find different sounds uh, uh, that uh, that were uh, available to us and, and and occurred in this in the fort, different things that made sounds. Uh, and then the lower right corner, uh, I've got a picture of my my colleague, Dr. Tanner, who's in a professor of environmental uh, science, uh, doing some uh, core samples as the young sound seekers look on from the dock uh, at him in the water, actually taking some core samples and them trying to record the sound of the in different tools that he uses. So this gives you an idea of the range of uh, creative uses of sound that we use that we have uh, in our programming uh, to learn about the environment. And it's in this, uh, and field recording features uh, heavily into that just because it's part of my creative practice and also part of uh, how we can uh, encourage active listening uh, amongst the students, teaching them about uh, field recorders and different uh, uh, uses uh, for that. 
Uh, and it's in this environment that we introduced uh, the hydro moths. Uh, and so it was a way that we thought we could engage them uh, more directly in kind of the discovery instead of some an expert coming in to um, demonstrate for them kind of the things that they do. Uh, we wanted to actually design an activity that they could be involved with the discovery. They could actually uh, drive part of the uh, the field work that was going on and actually gaining uh, ga gathering sounds uh, from the environment. Uh, and so we where we where home base for us, where we go, where we spend the most amount of time is at Canaveral National Seashore. Uh, and on the screen now, I got a picture uh, that is taken from uh, the top of a shell midden at um, uh, at uh, Canaveral National Seashore. It's about 10 meters high. Uh, and it kind of we're looking southward out over Mosquito Lagoon is on the, the right. But you can also see this narrow strip of barrier islands on the left. Uh, very green, lush environment, uh, and then just a little bit of the Atlantic Ocean on the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, the sky is very clear with a few patches of billowy clouds, um, uh, but it's a, a good shot of Mosquito Lagoon uh, on the left, to kind of just to give you an overview of just the the, the environment what we're on. Uh, and this is we knew I personally knew and they knew from uh, some of our listening activities that this is a very active soundscape inside of Mosquito Lagoon. Uh, and I kind of asked them, like with the hydro moths and introducing this idea of uh, recorders that we could program and leave behind, you know, what if we didn't need to take breaks? You know, what if we could leave recorders behind and have them pick up sounds uh, throughout the day? Um, and so uh, we designed, I, 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 I kind of put my head together before uh, involving the kids and how could we build something that they themselves could uh, actually put together and, and manage um, and sketched up uh, a really uh, low cost um uh, deployment rig, uh, actually using some, uh, so I've got a sketch on the screen now uh, that shows the dock and shows how I took a, some marine rope uh, to lower over the edge of the dock. Uh, and I found some stainless, stainless steel water bottles, which uh, the neck of them is about the size of the Velcro strap that comes with the Hydra Moth. Uh, so putting it around the neck of the, of the water bottle and then filling the water bottle with sand to, to make it a weight and lowering it over the side of the dock uh, uh, on a marine rope so that it, it uh, lands on the bottom and stays there on the bottom. So I uh, sketched this up, uh, got a permit from the National Park Service to do this with the kids uh, and uh, turn this into reality. So uh, next up on the screen, you've got a picture from September 24th when we put the rig together. Uh, and uh, it's a quick, uh, inexpensive uh, rig that can be lowered over the edge of a dock uh, and is uh, materials that the, the kids can easily uh, manage themselves, easy for them to assemble uh, and put together and uh, uh, simple and inexpensive. Uh, so you can see a picture of the this this rig sitting on the uh, the front porch of one of the older houses there at Canaveral National Seashore. Um, and when we actually did the first deployment, it was a really, a really a big, exciting day for the kids to to get them involved and have them uh, involved in the deployment. This is uh, Tiffany is uh, this is a, a group of us on the end of the dock and Tiffany has her back to us in the red shirt. Uh, about to uh, lower it uh, over the side, being assisted by uh, two of my Stetson students, uh, Bray and Sam, who were involved in uh, helping her out uh, with this. Uh, before we left it in the, we had permission to leave it in the uh, lagoon for two months. Uh, and before we did that, though, I, I made the point that we want probably maybe make a, a a quick test of it. So we use the switch, the default switch, to throw it on uh, and uh, set up the rig and lower it over. And uh, thankfully, it immediately yielded some results. I'm going to just play an example for you to, to play the first uh, test recording. So immediately upon hitting the, bo the bottom of a lagoon, uh, it cre we picked up this sound. I'll just let that play while I switch back to my slides here. Yeah, so I don't know if anybody knows uh, that sound, but that is a toadfish uh, actually uh, singing in the in the lagoon, um, and they they have this call that they uh, produce, uh, and they're very active in the September October months, and then they go quiet in November. And I was kind of hopeful that we would pick one up, uh, but uh, right off the bat, we we kind of struck gold in terms of of uh, picking up these toadfish. Um, so uh, we talked to the kids about the what the protocol was going to be. We settled on five minutes out of every 30 minutes. So at the top of the hour and the bottom of the hour, the audio, the hydromoth would turn on and record for five minutes. 
Uh, we did a, a deployment behind the visitor center, which is the picture that's on the screen uh, now. We also did a second deployment on that dock that it was on my title slide behind uh, a, a where uh, a called a location called Eldora, about a mile south of the visitor center. Uh, so you can see here a split screen of photo of uh, Walker, Tim, and uh, my student Bray, uh, my, my Stetson student Bray, uh, lowering the second deployment over the dock. And then our simple uh, solution uh, to tie off the recorder was to just, uh, it was represented by the picture on the, the right-hand side, uh, just taking the marine rope, uh, wrapping it around, tying a knot. Uh, and then we took a, a business card with a QR code on the back uh, and laminated it and attached it to the rope just so that if anybody was curious what was going on there, uh, they had a way of contacting us and um, uh, finding out a little bit about that. So uh, that was our deployment uh, plan. And then uh, the hurricane uh, came our way. So uh, Hurricane Ian moved in toward Florida. And I, uh, I've i I've lived in Florida uh, for most of my life. Uh, I'm used to their erratic patterns that hurricanes have. It's impossible to predict uh, where they're going to go. Uh, and this just happened to be a situation where we were in the right place at the right time. Um, if I show you the track of Hurricane Ian, uh, it originated in the south uh, of the Caribbean, below Cuba and Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Jamaica. It kind of uh, went from um, east to west and crossed over the western tip of Cuba before crossing into the, the western coast of, um, of, of Florida, right around Fort Myers. Um, and uh, there's actually a, an article in the New York Times today, uh, luckily enough, uh, about the kind of re continuing recovery ef efforts in Fort Myers, because we're one year on uh, from the, the landing of Hurricane Ian uh, in Florida. Uh, but if I put an arrow, so it crossed over the peninsula of Florida. And if I put an arrow on the, the map uh, to show you where our hydromoths were, we were right there where the path crossed Florida. Uh, and, uh, of course, hurricanes weaken as they cross land, uh, but uh, it still is it was an interesting uh, intersection of where we had deployed and where the hurricane uh, crossed. Uh, to give you a sense uh, from the National Hurricane Center's uh, after report, they do these on um, all the hurricanes. So I'll just read this real quickly, what I have on my slide. Um, the, the cyclone steadily weakened as it moved northeastward across the Florida Peninsula late that day and overnight, and it became a tropical storm with a maximum sustained winds of 60 knots uh, by 1200 uh, UTC, that's universal time code, uh, 29th of September, uh, just as the center was emerging over the Atlantic near the water, uh, Atlantic waters near Cape Canaveral, Florida, or essentially where our hydromoths were deployed in this uh, lagoon system uh, on the east coast of uh, Fl central Florida. Uh, so to put it in perspective, 60 knots is roughly 69 miles per hour or uh, uh, 111 kilometers per hour. Uh, for those of you that are thinking metric, um, the uh, so that's a pretty uh, rough sustained winds, not to mention uh, choppy waters uh, that were created by the hurricane in the lagoon. Uh, and after the hurricane passed over, the park was closed for about eight days. So there's eight days that I could not get back into the park in order to check on our hydromoth recorders where I didn't know what had happened to them. Um, uh, but once I did get into the park on October 7th, this is what I found at the Eldora dock where our hydromoth recorders uh, were um, uh, were deployed. The, there was evidence that the water had actually uh, been up over the dock and had been quite high because of the storm surge. But by the time I got there on the 7th, it had receded. Uh, and if I put a arrow, so this is a picture of the dock and there you can see some debris. Uh, a lot of the debris had been cleared out by National Park staff by the time I got there. Uh, but if I put an arrow on here, you can see our hydromoth uh, rig was actually up on the dock uh, so it, it, the, the waters were choppy enough that it had been picked up off the bottom of the lagoon and flung onto the, the surface of the, the dock. Um, and I, can, I don't have an exact measurement of how deep it was, uh, but I can safely say that I had let out 10 feet or three meters of rope to get it to the bottom of the lagoon. So to give you a sense of how violent the, uh, the, the, the waves were at this time. Um, that's 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 a sense to give you a sense of it uh, that, that that that's how violent they were to pick something up off the the ten meters below uh, the surface and uh, drop it onto the the top of the uh, the dock. So um, the recorder survived. Uh, it did uh, just fine and uh, actually picked up the sound. So uh, my my timing was a little bit off from the what the National uh, Hurricane Center uh, said. So I can flip over to my uh, sound file. So this is what it picked up at. Excuse me, at uh, 1300. 
And then if I click on uh, what happened uh, just after that, 30 minutes afterwards. So on the screen, while I was playing those, I was just showing the spectrogram and you can see a clear difference in the spectrogram uh, before where we've got some heightened activity. Um, and then that uh, spectrogram of where something really violent occurs, basically uh, uh, causing the spectrogram to go really red, really intense uh, across the frequency spectrum. Uh, I did lower that 75% before blasting it out via uh, Skype. I apologize for not giving you a little bit of a warning that I was <laughs> had some uh, distorted sound coming through there. Uh, uh, later recordings uh, showed that it uh, actually landed outside of the water, um, and that wasn't really uh, good for uh, soundscape mod monitoring. Uh, but uh, I guess the, the 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 result in terms of the hurricane is that it actually survived uh, ha having this uh, intense storm pass directly overhead. My little uh, cheap uh, hy hydromoth uh, rig there with the uh, so. Uh, to talk a little bit about other results, um, obviously I've got some gaps in the data set because my uh, hydromoth ended up outside of the water uh, at Eldora, but at the visitor center, it's actually stayed in the water. Uh, and what was interesting is that the, the toad fish actually went quiet uh, during the intense part of the storm. Uh, and then immediately afterwards, uh, they actually lowered their pitch. Uh, uh, being a musician, uh, I can I can tell you that it's about a major third that they stepped down in pitch. Uh, so if you can remember the, I'm, I'm I'm watching my time. Niels, am I okay to go about five minutes over just because we started a little late? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, if I can play for you just what the high, the toadfish sounded like on October 1st, this is after the storm. So you can hear that lower pitch. Uh, it was definitely, it's definitely, I haven't done a full analysis of the, the recordings, but it's definitely less frequent and a lower pitch in response to the storm. Uh, and then by uh, October 9th, they're back up to their normal pitch uh, range that they're in, okay. Um, other things that happened, uh, well, so because of the Eldora uh, 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 mishap, uh, I didn't have quite uh, the same results in terms of monitoring things, but the, um, the recorder behind the visitor center, I was able to kind of track uh, the progress of how it degraded in t uh, over time. Uh, so I've got a f uh, four pictures here on the screen. In the upper uh, left corner is the is before deployment on October third. Is in the in the lower left corner. You can see the buildup. Uh, uh, well, you can see see me. I, I guess it moves. The next one is October seventh in the upper right corner. You can see some organic material starting to catch on the actual uh, the actual water bottle. By October twenty third, there's a significant buildup of our organic material and debris on on the recorder and then by november 8th i've got some uh some uh organic materials uh growing on the actual recorder over time uh so this gives you a sense of just how uh uh the 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 i don't know just how how the, these materials degraded over time which uh, was one of the things that i wanted to kind of uh, track uh for myself and also for the uh the kids um, what I learned is that although you buy a stainless steel water bottle, not all of the parts are stainless steel. And so the, the hinge, it was actually made of aluminum. And if you know anything about materials, aluminum doesn't do so well in salt water, uh, as well as the carabiner had a, a aluminum joint, uh, to it. And so this actually uh, resulted in me losing, uh, one of the recorders at Eldora. So that was, that 
further created a gap in my um, my my data set. And in addition to uh, learning how to manage the batteries and when to change out the batteries on these recorders. Um, so I, again, I, I looked at this as kind of a uh, um, a trial deployment for potentially a longer deployment in Mosquito Lagoon and learning how these uh, these inexpensive materials work uh, in, a, in a in a brackish saltwater environment. Um, so, uh, but the, I guess the, the, the lesson here is that ultimately the salt water was worse for the, this, the, the hydro moss than the hurricane was. Uh, so, uh, when we finally remove, so uh, the picture here is of just uh, to show you some of the, the close up of the materials and how they've degraded over time on the hinge and also, also the carabiner. Sorry, I'm just making sure I give, uh, descriptions of the, uh, uh, image images on the screen as well. Uh, on November 19th, uh, we actually removed the recorders for the final time uh, with the kids. Uh, so this is uh, Tiffany in the, the red jacket. She was actually involved in the deployment. She was very proud of the fact that she actually got to pull it back out of the water. Uh, and uh, we, as we marched out there and we're, we're kind of marching back in here to, to take a look at the, our, our find uh, from the dock. Um, uh, we the 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 buildup of material provided with some interesting tactile evidence for the kids uh, of what goes what happens when you leave something in the water for two months, uh, and so feeling the differences between uh, I had an extra water bottle that was clean that hadn't been in the lagoon, uh, comparing that with the water bottle that had been in the lagoon, and the buildup of material uh, and the rough tactile surface. So this is James on the the left actually touching the the water bottle and feeling the the difference. Uh, Tiffany on the right actually feeling some of that organic material that had grown on on the water bottle. Um, so it made for a fun tactile expl explanation uh, uh, exploration with the kids uh, of, of the material at, at a buildup. Uh, in addition, I was able to, as I had pulled the recordings, um, use my scripts to uh, scan through them and find some interesting sounds for them. Uh, and I designed a, a game uh, that we played where they had to... Uh, where I had uh, two of them listening to examples of recordings that were made in the lagoon uh, from our two month deployment. Uh, and we work really hard with them on how to describe sounds, uh, equipping them with the vocabulary for how to talk about sound uh, with specific um, uh, uh, adjectives and things like that. Uh, and so we made a game of it where two uh, of them listened to the sounds and then had to describe them to the group. Then we played the sound for the group and we voted on who gave the best description uh, so one of the things I've learned about quickly about these kids is they they really like competitive things. So turning it into a game uh, made it kind of fun uh, for them to listen to and review a lot of the sounds that we uh, picked up from this uh, active soundscape in the in, uh, Mosquito Lagoon. So in summary, um, salt water is a lot worse for these uh, uh, these uh, this 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 cheap rig that I, I put together uh, than the hurricane was. Uh, uh, so and just making sure that when you buy something that says it's stainless steel, that every single part is stainless steel. So one of the things I want to learn uh, learn from that is uh, changing out the hinge with maybe a stainless steel cable so that it, uh, it uh, survives uh, better in the lagoon. Uh, I think it's an excellent uh, way to uh, build some discovery activities uh, with kids. Uh, it's definitely led to a new obsession for myself uh, with these toadfish in the lagoon. I had picked them up on my recorders uh, before, but uh, listening to their patterns, uh, and they do go quiet uh, in November, December, January. And so uh, one of the things I've been working on with this material for myself is actually um, using this uh, to build a training set in R uh, to be able to identify the toadfish uh, very quickly, scanning with uh, machine listening, machine learning uh, capabilities inside of the R programming language. Uh, and my dream is to do a year long study where we kind of map the, 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 the ebb and flow of their calls in the lagoon over the course of a year. Uh, but I need to uh, gather some partners and, and get some, uh, get, get my ducks in a row before, um, uh, going off with that. So uh, I'll just conclude with um, some some credits and acknowledgement. Uh, obviously, I need to thank my partners at the National Park Service. Uh, they uh, provided me with a permit to, to do this uh, research. Uh, and you can see the re the permit number on the screen. Uh, obviously, uh, the kids in Young Sound Seekers have, or have been great uh, partners and collaborators and, and fun. It's fun to teach them uh, once a month on weekends uh, and head out to the parks and, 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 and do activities uh, around sound with them. Um, my students at Stetson University, uh, particularly my my uh, my my program assistants who work with the kids, so Katrina and Marvel and uh, I don't want to forget anybody, Alexia and uh, Delaney and 
uh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting somebody, but anyway. Uh, and Eve Pear is my co-director at Atlantic Center for the Arts, uh, helping me uh, with directing the Young Sound Seekers program. And lastly, thanks to Niels for this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, how we use the Hydro Moths. So uh, again, I'm Nathan Wallach. Uh, for anybody who maybe joined a little late, uh, thanks for listening to my talk, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for this really great talk. Um, I really like the fact that you've involved kids at every stage of the process as well. Because mm. um, we see many projects where, um, especially when it comes to citizen science, where it's more the data collection that's mm. citizen driven, but then perhaps not so much the, the analysis. Uh, now, there are limitations to that, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. In this case, you involve them in every step of the way, which which I think is really great. And uh, yeah, it's also uh, brutal to see how much uh, how much worse salt water is than hurricanes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I it, it obviously does make sense, but when you think of salt water and the hurricanes, the latter mm -hmm. is obviously more violent. But it's the slow and steady that just destroys everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I've got the cap here, so I can. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Terms of what it did, what it did to the uh, the this part is aluminum, and that's really what degrade the the, the yeah. hinge on it is what degraded over time. So I think just replacing the hinge with something like a stainless steel cable would help. <laughs> that's my plan for a, a future deployment. Oh, <laughs> I was I was trying to understand what Andrew just posted, uh, but it it. Doesn't have to do because we were talking okay. about water, and then you mentioned water. Like, oh, is that a question? Ah, okay, <laughs> no, not quite. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Um, I have questions. So you uh, showed us that you recorded toadfish. Are there any other fish-like sounds that you perhaps may not have been able to assign to species, uh, but that you did record and that sort of? Yeah, it did. It captured um, some chewing sounds. I can play yeah. some of those if I'm still on sound. I don't know. Am I still sh sharing sound through this or no? I don't think so. Possibly not. Okay. So yeah, we've we got some some chewing sounds. So that's indiscriminate. Some drumming sounds. Uh, that uh, in addition, part of the reason we did a little bit uh, five minute samples. Uh, the kids were interested in maybe picking up some dolphins, which do come through the lagoon, and I've I've I picked them up uh, when I'm sitting there recording for 20, 30 minutes uh, easily. Uh, and I know from that that they when they come through, it's a really short burst. So I didn't I didn't want to do like one minute every ten minutes like some people do with sampling. I wanted to do a little bit longer to potentially capture some of the uh, dolphins coming through with their um their ultrasonic clicks basically they're using for echolocation and, and it the hydromoth did pick them up um oh, cool. in addition to engines of boats going through and, and things like that as well so uh the the range of uh of, of sounds uh, in the lagoon is is quite uh quite nice great uh is that bottom nose dolphin was that a different one yeah, it's yeah. Atlantic cool. dolphin. Yeah. Um, and do you get manatees there, or is it on the other side? No, we do get manatees in the lagoon. I've um, uh, where I've been successful picking up manatees is actually in the springs uh, further inland. Uh, they don't tend to be vocalizing as much when they're out in the lagoon. Um, okay. Yeah, because there is, uh, I think, it, a project in Florida looking at specifically the vocalizations of manatees. So that's what right. I was asking. Um, and that is something we may hear about in at a future conference. Uh, they weren't quite ready for this one, but I'm hoping that for sure. a future one, they'd be ready. Um, side note there. Uh, there's a question. I'd be interested to hear how doing more work on the research side has impacted your creative projects in any way. Ooh. Um... Uh, it's, I mean, to me, it's like uh, they're they're kind of running in tandem, running in in uh, parallel. But I I uh, I definitely in my creative practice um, enjoy using large data sets, and so I I think that that's uh, some a reflection of what I see going on in um, in science right now of like these recorders that can be out for you know weeks and months and gathering sounds at, at a time. So I I tend to use. Uh, large sets of samples in my uh, creative work, uh, and that's kind of a reflection of, of of that those those big data sets in the on the research side. Does that make sense, Garrison? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hmm? Um, 
I have a question for Andy, who's in the audience. Uh, does that mean the Hadramoth is certified hurricane proof then? <laughs> I guess Something so. no manufacturer ever wants to hear. Um, oh, there's a, a more serious note. Um, thank you for the presentation. An amazing work, especially you combine the whole idea with education involving individuals with disabilities. Just wonder why you chose metal bottles over other materials such as plastics. Yeah, uh, the the metal was intentional just because I was worried about uh, plastics uh, shedding potentially microplastics into the lagoon. I figured the the steel was a little bit better in terms of uh, potentially shedding micromaterials. Of course, I for I didn't account for part of the structure being aluminum and then that degrading and and uh, uh, leaving in the lagoon. And I I kind of I I I mentioned that. Um, uh, we lost I, I, one of the recorders actually got lost because that hinge was uh, uh, aluminum and broke. Uh, so I started this project with four hydromoths, I deployed two of them, lost one and had to replace it. So it's actually at the bottom of the lagoon somewhere. Uh, uh, and so I think my, I mean, my yes. other, I guess, practical advice for people is if you're planning for hydromoth or audio moth deployments, start with more equipment that you need because you, you might lose it to the elements. You might lose it to people, uh, and, and other, uh, projects basically. So that that's definitely a, uh, a, a bit of advice uh, coming out of this as well. So. Yeah. Um, so with other hydromoth deployments, I've also seen, uh, sort of brick slash uh, building blocks, like any kind of cement concrete block being mm -hmm. used, but then you wouldn't deploy it in necessarily the same way as you did dropping it yeah. off from a dock. I think you'd need someone in the water to do that. Mm -hmm. So it is a little bit different. Uh, and the logistics involved in either solution are different, so yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, because of my work with Young Sound Seekers, I really wanted it to be something that they could manage themselves and they could see themselves doing, you know, so uh, water bottle uh, and I could, you know, say, hey, take this water bottle, go over there and fill it with sand so that it becomes a weight, basically. And then it it, it, it was a way to kind of plug in different uh, kids uh, from mm -hmm. the process. I see one more uh, question. Uh, yeah. Do you, underwater soundscapes have anything comparable to the dawn chorus? And are there sort of more active or quiet periods. Yeah, I I can't vouch for that in my results. I have seen some people talk about that in other uh, studies of underwater soundscapes. And that's part of what I hope to do uh, with a longer deployment in Mosquito Lagoon. I think I, I've, I've created the structure uh, and now in terms of now I know uh, what works with these kind of inexpensive uh, deployments, uh, in, inexpensive rigs. Uh, I've I've made contacts with the National Park Service. They kind of trust me in terms of getting things out in the lagoon and recovering them. So uh, one of the things I hope to do, like I, I mentioned, is doing a longer uh, deployment, longer than two months and hopefully a full year, uh, because uh, I, I want to study these things like Don choruses in, in the water, you know, do the toadfish, you know, sing more in the morning than they do overnight. Um and I can do some of that with my analysis, but it was kind of patchy if I, I, at best. Uh, and then I'm also interested in potentially, uh, there's an interesting study out of uh, the Florida Bay that talked about um, uh, lunar cycles and the impact that they have on um, sing singing versus not singing in the, uh, the, the toadfish.